Confirm being present, uh, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, hearing entitled Rise of the Drones II, examining the legality of unmanned targeting, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, it's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that written testimony from the American Civil Liberties Union, Ms. Hina Shamsi and Mr. John Radson, be submitted for the record and without objection, so ordered. Well, good morning again. You know, today, the subcommittee continues its oversight of the use of unmanned weapons systems in the conflict in Afghanistan and around the globe. On March 23rd, the subcommittee held its first hearing on this emerging issue. We heard from a number of experts who testified to the wide array of issues implicated by the use of drones, including operational, political, and ethical questions. Today, we'll take a closer look at one important aspect of drone use, the legality of using unmanned weapons to target individuals who pose a threat to our national security. When the United States ratified the Geneva Conventions in 1955, the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations characterized the agreements as follows. As a landmark in the struggle to obtain for military and civilian victims of war a humane treatment in accordance with the most approved international usage, the United States has a proud tradition of support for individual rights, human freedom, and the welfare and dignity of man. Approval of these conventions by the Senate would be, in full, would be fully in conformity with this great tradition. So warfare has changed significantly since the Geneva Conventions were written, but the ideals cited by the Senate Committee in 1955 have not. Today, we'll examine how these laws apply in modern times. The increasing reliance on unmanned weapons to target individuals has been well documented in the press. Over the past decade, the number of unmanned vehicles used by the Department of Defense has gone from a few hundred to several thousand. Drones have been credited with eliminating senior leaders of the Taliban and other insurgent groups, and accounts of the recent addition of an American citizen to the target list have received widespread attention. These reports have raised serious questions about whether targeted killing and drone use comport with the relevant international and domestic laws. The use of unmanned weapons to target individuals, and for that matter, the targeting of individuals in general, raises many complex legal questions. We must examine who can be a, le a legitimate target, where that person can be legally targeted, and when the risk of collateral damage is too high. We must ask whether it makes a difference if the military carries out an attack, or whether other government entities, such as the Central Intelligence Agency, may legally conduct such attacks. We must ensure that the administration's understanding of the authorities granted to it by Congress do not exceed what Congress intended. And we have here today a distinguished panel of legal experts to help answer some of these questions. I understand that you're not going to agree on all of the answers and probably not going to be able to give us totally all the answers, but we're looking to learning quite a bit from your conversation. On March 25th, the State Department legal advisor, Harold Coe, gave a speech at the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law, in which he affirmed this administration's commitment to following international law. In his words, this is a commitment to, and I quote, following universal standards, not double standards, end quote. It is in this context, then, that we turn to our witnesses today, with the understanding that the United States is committed to following international legal standards, and that our interpretation of how these standards apply to the use of unmanned weapon systems will set an example for other nations to follow. I do not expect that we'll be able to fully answer any of these complex questions today, but I do hope that this will be the beginning of a conversation, one that this committee will continue with members of the administration, including Legal Advisor Coe. And with that, I uh, defer to Mr. Blake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for coming. Um, since we met last, uh, obviously the administration has gone on record um, to state that the use of unmanned uh, drones in combat is legal under international law. Look forward to uh, uh, hearing some further clarification. Uh, look forward to hearing from uh, Mr. Anderson, who was here last time as a minority witness, and now he's a majority witness. I hope that uh, Republicans in Congress follow the same trajectory and, uh, soon. But <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Inside joke, okay. But anyway, glad to have you all here and uh, appreciate uh, you coming um, and, uh, and testifying and for Mr. Anderson for coming back. Thanks. I could say that it shows that it's not the Senate. We can actually do things and agree <laughs> uh, and, and do something on that. Uh, let me introduce our witnesses from whom we'll be receiving testimony today. Uh, first on our panel is Mr. Kenneth Anderson, who was, in fact, with us at our last hearing. He's a professor at Washington College of Law at American University and a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is an authority on international human rights, war, armed conflict, and terrorism. And he testified, as I said, at our first hearing. 
He's also previously served on the Board of Directors of America's Watch, the precursor to Human Rights Watch, and is the founder and former director of the Human Rights Watch Arms Division. He holds a BA from UCLA and a JD from Harvard University. Ms. Mary Ellen O'Connell is the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame Law School. Ms. O'Connell's primary research focuses on international legal regulation of the use of force as well as conflict and dispute resolution. She's the author of The Power and Purpose of International Law as well as three case books on international law. It is active in a number of international law organizations, including the American Society of International Law and the Council on Foreign Relations. Ms. O'Connell earned her BA from Northwestern University and is, was awarded a Marshall Scholarship for study in Britain, where she received a Master's in Science in International Relations from the London School of Economics and an LLB from Cambridge University. She earned her JD from Columbia University. Mr. David Glazier is a professor of law at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Prior to joining Loyola Law School, Professor Glazier was a lecturer at the University of Virginia School of Law and a research fellow at, fellow at the Center for National Security Law, where he conducted research on national security, military justice, and the law of war. Before attending law school, Glazier served 21 years as a surface warfare a officer in the United States Navy. In that capacity, he commanded the USS George Phillip, served as the 7th Fleet Staff Officer responsible for the U.S. Navy-Japan relationship, and participated in UN sanctions enforcements against Yugoslavia and Haiti. Mr. Glazier holds a BA from Amherst College, earned an MA from Georgetown University, and holds a JD from the University of Virginia Law School. Mr. William Banks is the founding director of the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism at Syracuse University, where he's also the, on the board of uh, advisors, a distinguished professor of law, and a professor of public administration in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Is recognized internationally as an expert in constitutional law, national security law, and counterterrorism. Mr. Banks authored a leading text in the field in 1990 entitled National Security Law. In 2007, he published a second leading textbook entitled Counterterrorism Law to help define that emerging field as well. He is also editor in chief of the Journal of National Security Law and Policy. He holds a BA from the University of Nebraska and received his JD from the University of Denver. So, again, we've got quite a bit of brain power being thrust upon us here today, and, and uh, we do appreciate you taking the time and making yourselves available to share with us that substantial expertise. Uh, it is the policy of the subcommittee to swear in our witnesses before they testify, so I ask that you please stand uh, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the record will please reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative, uh, and I can tell all of you and remind Mr. Anderson that your complete written statements will be in the record uh, by agreement uh, the unanimous consent of the committee. We ask that you try to keep your opening remarks to about five minutes, if you could. You'll see the lights uh, green for the first four minutes, amber for the fifth minute, then red. It was about the time we'd like you to come to a, not a screeching halt, but a, a nice uh, conclusion of your remarks so that we can have an opportunity to have a colloquy back and forth and, and ask some questions on that. So if that's understood, uh, Mr. Anderson, would you please uh, begin with your remarks? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the committee for having us here today. Um, the last time that this committee held a hearing on this subject, uh, I was a very strong voice of criticism of the uh, administration and its senior lawyers for not having expressed any views as to the legality of the use of drones and targeted killing practices and the whole cluster of issues that we are in fact here to discuss today. And I have been a very sharp critic of this and in fact was before this committee and I'm delighted to report as everyone here knows that um, a few days after that and not in response to this I know that this policy had been under consideration for a very long time at the State Department. Uh, Harold Coe, the legal advisor to state, uh, delivered a speech in which he addressed these issues. Um, and I am both delighted that uh, the issues have been raised publicly by the administration, by its most senior international lawyer, uh, and as well I'm uh, myself very happy with the content. So I'm in the, um, I guess I would say, unaccustomed position of attempting somewhat to channel uh, legal advisor Coe on this occasion. And he said in those remarks that there were four objections that he wanted to address in relation to uh, targeted killing. One was that the very act of targeting a particular leader was itself a violation of uh, the laws of war. And quite strikingly, in addressing that objection, he went to 
state practice. He didn't cite directly to law as such. He didn't cite court cases. He didn't. He cited American state practice in the Second World War um, as a basis for uh, stating that this was not contrary to international law, uh, which I thought was actually quite striking in referring to the actual ways in which states behave uh, as a source of law uh, in these areas. Second, he addressed the question of um, is there something just really um, not okay, morally wrong or reprehensible or legally wrong about the use of high advanced weaponry drones. Um, and he said, no, there's nothing particular about weapon systems, uh, except in a very few cases of indiscriminateness, um, that will outlaw them. Um, and being high tech, and in fact, this is all good in this area because it allows discrimination and targeting that's otherwise not there. Third, he addressed the question of whether this is extrajudicial execution um, and hence in violation of the um, of international treaties and covenants and so on and, and whether in particular there's an obligation to provide process or warning to people before targeting them where they have been identified by the United States as targets. And here he introduced something that I think is of deep importance um, as a statement of U.S. policy because he very clearly distinguished between saying it is lawful to do this both in an armed conflict governed by the technical body of the laws of war and it is also lawful to do so when the United States is engaged in legitimate international self-defense as a category of the use of force separate from uh, armed conflict specifically as a technical matter. And he defended targeting without warning in each of those cases treated separately. And then finally, and I think of great importance within the United States, the United States has had a long ban on assassination uh, within its domestic rules. Uh, but it's never defined what it means by that. And he was very careful to reaffirm something that was said by um, his predecessor in 1989, Abraham Sofer and said that this is not assassination within the meaning of, of U.S. law. Now, I support all of those, and in particular the distinction that was drawn between armed conflict and legitimate self-defense as a category, and would reiterate what I raised in the last uh, hearing, which is this discussion is not really about the use of drones on the battlefield in the traditional ordinary sense as used by the U.S. military. It's for them a weapons platform like any other and all the considerations of collateral damage and all the usual stuff that goes into targeting applies, but they don't really think of it any differently as one could see from the last hearing. The question here is who and where, and it's the question first of all of whether it is lawful to target off of what one might consider a traditional battlefield and whether there is in fact any legal distinction between going after your enemies wherever they happen to be on the one hand, and the CIA um, attacking people outside of traditional zones. So let me bring this to a close by saying that the discussion with, that we're having is really the discussion about the lawfulness of the CIA using these kinds of weapons outside of the traditional battlefields. And that if for any reason that's considered not to be okay, that that's considered to be criminal, that that's considered to be a war crime, somebody had better tell the CIA about it, somebody had better tell the President about it, somebody had better tell Vice President Biden about it because they are all enthusiastic participants in this. So it is a perfectly legitimate question to raise whether this is okay and lawful and the rest, but whatever the answer is, we should not leave the people who are carrying this out in legal uncertainty as to what that answer is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do, yes. Ms. O'Connell. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the invitation to speak with you today about the law governing the use of weaponized unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as combat drones. I should mention that I have been a professional military educator for the Department of Defense, and I'll be drawing on that experience and the learning I gained in that context in making three points for you today. First, combat drones are battlefield weapons. Second, the battlefield is a real place where fighting occurs between organized armed groups. Uh, battlefields and armed conflicts are not fictions created
created by lawyers. Third, permissible battlefield use of combat drones is governed by law regulating who may operate them, against whom they be, may be operated, and how they may be used. Turning to my first point, combat drones are a battlefield weapon. They launch missiles and drop bombs of significant kinetic force. Such weapons are permitted on the battlefield, but we do not permit our police to have missiles or bombs in their arsenals. They are not allowed to use that kind of firepower in carrying out law enforcement activities. Today, in Afghanistan, our armed forces are involved in an armed conflict. They are facing an organized enemy capable of holding territory. In the coming battle for Kandahar, they will be permitted to use drones. And indeed, I would suggest to you that the use of drones in that context will be preferable to the use of airplanes dropping bombs from high altitudes. The drone, of course, as you learned at your last hearing, has a video camera capability. It can send back very detailed information, including on the location of civilians in a combat zone and with regard to the details of civilian objects. In that way, the pilot of the drone or the operator from a long distance can make much more precise targeting decisions than can be made from an airplane. General McChrystal has wisely called for strict avoidance of civilian casualties in our counterinsurgency war in Afghanistan, and I believe that drones can help us accomplish this. But outside of a war or an armed conflict, everyone is a civilian when it comes to the use of lethal force. The combatant's privilege to kill on the battlefield without being charged with a crime applies inside an armed conflict and not outside, which leads to my second point. Armed conflict is a real situation that we know by the facts of fighting. Armed conflicts exist where organized armed fighting occurs, where there are intense hostilities. Armed conflicts cannot be created on paper in a legal memo that then translates into the right to kill as if you were on a real battlefield. The law I am explaining is derived from the just war doctrine. That doctrine has held that killing is only justifiable in situations of necessity. Battlefields where intense fighting is occurring is a per se situation of necessity. Off the battlefield, we give the police the right to use lethal force only in situations of immediate necessity to save a life. This rule means police do not have bombs and missiles in their arsenals. They have handguns and rifles. Even in places like Yemen and Pakistan, where there is armed conflict going on, the United States would only have the right to use combat drones in the armed conflicts that those governments are participating in, and not in some rogue operation of our own that has nothing to do with, the government, with what those governments are trying to accomplish. We recognize neither of those states as failed states. Indeed, we're very much dependent on both Yemen and Pakistan having strong governments, strong identities, and being stable states. In order to build that stability in both countries, we need to respect their sovereign rights as defined by international law. And that means that we do not have the right to use military force except with their express permission and in pursuit of their aims. Even when we are invited to join in an armed conflict, as we have been in Afghanistan, it is that invitation that makes it lawful for us to participate in that armed conflict. We uh, have certain very strict rules in terms of how we may operate combat drones. First and foremost, only a combatant, a lawful combatant, may uh, carry out uh, the use of uh, killing with combat drones. The CIA and civilian contractors have no right to do so. They do not wear uniforms, and they are not in the chain of command. And most importantly, they are not trained in the law of armed conflict. That is why we have reason to fear that CIA-directed uh, combat operations are having disproportionate impacts on civilians, and they are pursuing their uh, use of lethal force not in a way aimed at accomplishing the military objective which in this case is to stop terrorists 
We, we know from empirical data, and this is my final point, that the use of major military force in counterterrorism operations has been counterproductive. The just war doctrine teaches that we should always and only use force when we can accomplish more good than harm. And that is not the case with the use of drones in places like Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Glazier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to um, begin very quickly by thanking the Chairman and members of the Committee for holding this hearing, because so much of the discussion after 9-11 has really been political. Um, and as a citizen and as a law professor, uh, I'm very appreciative of the fact that the Committee really is interested in exploring the legal issues. Um, I think that there's no doubt about the fact that we are in an armed conflict. I mean, first of all, as a matter of international law, the world community has recognized 9-11 as an armed attack. And more importantly, as a matter of our domestic law, Congress has chosen to exercise its constitutional authority to authorize the use of military force against the organizations responsible for the 9-11 attack and any organizations that harbored them. So it seems to me that as a matter of law, there is no dispute that we are in an armed conflict with al-Qaeda uh, and with the Taliban. And that, therefore, allows the United States to call upon the full scope of authority which is provided by the law of war. Uh, many people perceive that there is sort of a false dichotomy between compliance with stringent rules in the law of war and military and political success. Uh, and the thing I'd like to emphasize up front is I, I really feel that this is a false dichotomy. I think that we fail to recognize oftentimes how much the law of war was developed by warriors and how much military necessity and the ability to accomplish what a nation needs to do uh, to successfully prosecute an armed conflict is already addressed within that body of law. Uh, I also want to suggest that the fact that many of the instruments which comprise the law of war are dated is not necessarily a major issue when it comes to dealing with modern technology like drones, because much of the law of war is expressed in the form of general rules and guiding principles which can readily be applied to new technical developments that weren't anticipated uh, at the time the war is developed. And so principles like necessity, which Professor O'Connell has, has mentioned, um, requirements to discriminate in targeting um, proportionality, these rules are easy to apply to modern technology, just as easy as they are to apply to the technology that existed at the time. Now, there certainly is nothing within the law of war that prohibits um, the use of drones. In fact, the ability of the drones to engage in a higher level of precision and to discriminate more carefully between military and civilian targets um, than has existed in the past actually suggests that they're preferable uh, to many older weapons. Now, there certainly are issues um, with ex existing law that can come from bad choices made in their, in their deployment. We know, for example, that some of the early attacks, which resulted in larger numbers of casualties, have caused significant um, fallout. But again, that's an area in which compliance with the law of war, which requires careful discrimination between military and civilian tactics, suggests that, in fact, following the rules enhances uh, our ability to, to prevail uh, in the conflict. Um, there are real issues, though, I think, with who can employ the weapons, and that is something that, that I find very, very problematic. Um, the law of war has rules as far as who can be combatants who enjoy immunity from domestic laws for engaging in armed conflict. And so, for example, I think there's little doubt about the legality of the Air Force and National Guard uh, use of drones, on, which is an ongoing basis. But it's interesting that the government is using CIA personnel who clearly are not lawful combatants under the rules specified in the law of war. Now, we law of war scholars debate um, what it, what's the legal significance of that. I think, though, that the majority view um, is that if you are not a privileged combatant, you simply don't have immunity from domestic law uh, for participating in hostilities. And so the reality is that it seems to me, for example, that any CIA personnel who participate in this armed conflict run the risk of being prosecuted under the national laws of the places where they take place. On the other hand, though, today our government is in the process of trying to hold some of our adversaries criminally accountable at Guantanamo under a legal theory that being a non-privileged belligerent and engaging in war constitutes a war crime. 
So if that is in fact our government position, then our sense would be then that the CIA personnel participating in this program are committing war crimes and the individuals who've directed them to participate uh, are committing war crimes. So when we ask the government to sort of address these larger issues, it seems to me that one of the things we need to call upon them to do is to clarify the United States government's view on, on, on this aspect because either we're wrong at Guantanamo or we're seriously wrong in using the CIA to participate in the program. There are also issues about where uh, the conflict's taking place, which Professor O'Connell uh, addressed, and I think we'll probably have some spirited discussion and disagreement on those issues uh, during the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, Representative Flake, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. And these brief oral remarks, I'm going to focus indeed on the laws of the United States that govern the CIA's involvement in unmanned targeting. The decision to target specific individuals with lethal force after September 11th was neither unprecedented nor surprising. In appropriate circumstances, the United States has engaged in targeted killing at least since a border war with the Mexican bandits in 1916. In a time of war, subjecting individual combatants to lethal force has been a permitted and lawful instrument of waging war successfully, but new elements of targeted killing policy emerged in recent years in response to terrorism and to the threats against the United States. Among the new elements, of course, is a significant role for the CIA in controlling pilotless drones to carry out a targeted killing policy. It's important to emphasize that regardless of the policy efficacy of the drone strikes, it's never sufficient under the rule of law that a government policy be wise. It must also be supported by law, not just an absence of law violations, but positive legal authority. Indeed, where the subject is intentional, premeditated killing by the government, the need for clearly understood legal authority is paramount. After all, legal authority is what distinguishes murder from lawful policy. The National Security Act of 1947 authorized the CIA, I'm going to quote now, to perform such other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting the national security as the President or National Security Council may direct. Although the original grant of authority in 1947 likely did not contemplate targeted killing, the 47 Act was designed as dynamic authority to be shaped by practice and by necessity. By the 1970s, fitfully, the practice came to include targeted killing. After the Church Committee learned of and disapproved of CIA assassination plots in the mid-1970s, President Ford issued an executive order prohibiting CIA involvement in assassination, notably not restricting targeted killing, something we'll discuss later, and Congress enacted intelligence oversight legislation that, as amended, continues to require reporting by Congress uh, to Congress by the President of significant anticipated intelligence operations. In the weeks after 9-11, President Bush signed an intelligence finding giving the CIA broad authority to pursue terrorism around the world. By statute, the finding must accompany any covert operation approved by the President, including those that permit targeted killing. In this particular classified finding, the President reportedly delegated targeting and operational authority to senior civilian and military officials. The 2001 finding was apparently modified in 2006 by President Bush to broaden the class of potential targets beyond Osama bin Laden and his close circle and also to extend the boundaries of that authorization beyond Afghanistan. In explicitly permitting the targeting of an individual with lethal force, the finding also more narrowly focuses the potential to inflict violence. Ever since the Hughes-Ryan Amendment of 1974, Congress has authorized the CIA covert operations if findings are prepared, delivered to select members of Congress before the operation that's described, or in a timely fashion thereafter. So long as the committees, intelligence committees, are kept fully and currently informed, the intelligence laws permit the President broad discretion to utilize the nation's intelligence agencies to carry out national security operations, implicitly including targeting killing. 
Such an operation would follow intelligence law as, quote, an operation in foreign countries other than activities solely intended for obtaining ne necessary intelligence, and thus it would be conducted pursuant to statutory authority. To some, it seemed that the 2001 finding ran counter to the longstanding ban on political assassination enshrined in that executive order first issued by President Ford in 1976. The directive forbids political assassination but does not define the term. Just what does distinguish lawful targeted killing from unlawful political assassination? The answer turns upon which legal framework applies, as we'll discuss further here this morning. During war, whether authorized by Congress or fought defensively by the President on the basis of his authority, targeted killing of individual combatants is lawful although killing by treacherous means through the use of deceit or trickery is not. In peacetime, any extrajudicial killing by a government agent is lawful only if taken in self-defense or in defense of others. But what rules apply when the United States is engaged in, an interna in a non-traditional war on terrorism or a war against Al-Qaeda? The evolving customary law of anticipatory self-defense and intelligence legislation regulating the activities of the CIA supply adequate, albeit not well articulated or understood, legal authority for these drone strikes. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It certainly gives us some food for thought. <coughs> um, I'm going to begin the questions and, and, uh, and we'll go around. I suspect more than one uh, round here. So if I'm listening to all of you, you, you all uh, sort of agree that the who and the where are the principal issues here, who's doing, uh, the, who's using the drones and where that use is. Uh, I'll, I'll watch your heads, Bob, or, or go back and forth or whatever and to stop if somebody disagrees on that. So if it's on the battlefield and the military is doing it, uh, fine, nobody has a problem with that. Uh, if it's on the battlefield and the CIA or some other civilian organization is doing it, some people have a question or not. Some people do have a question. All right, Ms. O'Connell. So even if we're on the battlefield, we're in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, engaged with uh, who the military may think is Al Qaeda, or let's say, or the people that they're uh, in contest with, but they have the CIA doing the targeting of drones or whatever. What's the issue there? No, under international law of armed conflict, the CIA does not have the right to carry out battlefield killings. Professor Glazier and Professor Anderson both agreed with me on that, that the international law regulating the battlefield does not give the combatants privilege to kill without warning and not face prosecution to persons who are not members of the regular armed forces of a country, who are not under military discipline in a chain of command and not trained in the law of armed conflict. And those important characteristics, um, which as Professor Glazier said, we are holding people at Guantanamo because they didn't meet those characteristics. Um, those are failures, those are deficits on the part of the CIA. They simply have no right. Um, we, we, we're already facing 17 of our CIA agents are under indictment in Italy for attempting to kidnap someone off the streets of Milan, an alleged person with ties to Al Qaeda. If, the, if that's what the rest of the world thinks is the right result with regard to kidnapping, you can imagine what the rest of the world, uh, how the rest of the world views killing persons um, by the CIA. It's just a clear violation of international law. Mr. Edison, you want to respond um, to that? I would disagree in part with that, but I guess in terms of the framing issue that you raise, there are two issues um, implied. One is, what is the ability, if any, of the CIA lawfully to participate in something that is an armed conflict when they are civilians? Um, it's more complicated, I think, than Professor O'Connell suggests in the sense that their participation may or may not um, involve the combatant's privilege but does not make it um, per se unlawful under international law necessarily. Um, that is, there are questions about whether they are um, taking direct participation in hostilities. Uh, there are questions about um, their status as civilians uh, in the conflict zone. But then beyond that, there's a question as to where does this armed conflict run? Does it run outside of Afghanistan? Does it run into... Well, that was, that was 
going to be the next logical yeah, next. extension of this uh, on that. So. But that will be the question for the CIA, and they're two different questions if one accepts that these are two different um, situations geographically. Let, let me take this a little bit further. Suppose now we're talking about the situation in Yemen with uh, Anwar al Awlaki. Uh, so I guess you have to accept the fact or make the argument that he's uh, associated with al-Qaeda or somehow an al-Qaeda person or you have a problem right off the get-go, right? If he's not associated with somebody that you can make an argument that you're in a conflict with, you have an issue. Is it okay for our military at that point in time to say this is an extension of our conflict and we're going to use a drone and target this individual? Is that acceptable under international law? No. Um, that, that was a point of, of my remarks the as well. The battlefield issue. I'm sorry? Yeah, yes. You're talking about the it, battlefield issue. Yeah. In Yemen, this particular case, um, again, in 2002, when we carried out our first drone strike in Yemen and killed named individuals, the Air Force refused to carry out that operation. They were the ones operating drones at that time. And the, the, the CIA was willing to do it. The Air Force said, we don't have any right to kill in a situation in which we're not involved in a battle, in an armed conflict. And the, the Air Force was right. That was the correct legal intelligence. Professor Glazier said that we're, he agreed with this this. Uh, lawyer-created concept that we're in a worldwide self-defensive armed conflict against al-Qaeda and the Taliban and others, um, and he said that this is supported by the world. In fact, on, uh, after September 11th, the United Nations Security Council did find that the attacks gave rise to the right of the United States to engage in self-defense, but we engaged in the self-defense that the law of state responsibility gave us a right to engage in, and that was in Afghanistan. That was the state responsible for carrying out the attacks, for supporting al-Qaeda in being able to carry out those attacks. So we lawfully took the battle to Afghanistan. We engaged in lawful self-defense on the territory of the state where we had been attacked. But the rest of the world does not recognize the right to carry out attacks of a battlefield kind all over the world, such as in Yemen and in parts of Pakistan and other places. There, uh, there are many other countries that have been attacked by al-Qaeda. Great Britain, uh, Indonesia, Spain, Kenya, none of them consider themselves to be in an armed conflict all over the world against al-Qaeda. They consider themselves to be involved in counterterrorism operations. And using the methods that they've used, they've been very successful. The British have said, you are never in an armed conflict with terrorists. They are minor criminals. You do not elevate them to combatants. And President Ronald Reagan said the same. I agree with President Reagan. You cannot have a, an armed conflict with terrorists. They are mere combatants. They are not warriors, and they should never be elevated to the level of warriors. Our warriors are in an armed conflict in Afghanistan. We should be using counterterrorism, law enforcement techniques in other countries. We just don't have the right to bomb people where there's no armed conflict. This is where the five-minute rule is particularly limiting, but I'm Mr. Sorry. Flake, uh, no, it's from, for me, for, no, it's for you. Mr. Flake. Well, let me expand on that a bit. When we talk about Yemen, how many attacks, uh, uh, Ms. O'Connell, have we, that we know of, uh, that have been public, have we uh, used in Yemen as far as drone attacks? Um, I, I know of only three or four. One carried out in the Bush administration and the others in the Obama administration. The Obama administration has clearly stepped up the policy of using mm -hmm. drones in non-armed conflict situations. Did you we're drawing some kind of distinction earlier uh, with regard to whether or not we have permission from those states. Is that, uh, but it seems from what you're saying, that shouldn't even make a difference. There's a very key and often overlooked distinction. The invitation has to be to participate in the armed conflict that the government of the country is participating in. So Yemen right now is facing insurgencies in the north and the south. It's got two rather minor uh, insurgencies going on right now. They're getting some help from Saudi Arabia. They've requested that help with regard to one of these insurgencies. If they had asked us, the United States, to also be involved, we could use military force there on their invitation in their armed conflict. But what we've done in, in 2002, the case we know the most about, this, was, this attack was not part of any armed conflict that the Yemeni authorities were involved in. It was a six individuals in a vehicle in a remote area, and we killed all six persons, including a, a U.S. citizen. That's not an armed conflict that Yemen's engaged in. So that, so even having consent in that case is not sufficient. 
Mr. Banks, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the requirement that Congress be informed under the National Security Act. Is there ev any evidence that uh, Congress has not been informed sufficiently uh, with regard to these activities? Not to my knowledge, uh, Representative Flake. It's, it's of course, a very uh, broad grant of authority. Right. And the, and the reporting requirement is only ambiguously stated, but it's fully and currently informed. Right. So that language would, would suggest that Congress, the Intelligence Committee, should know the details about those operations. I take it you disagree, then, with, uh, the, with the position uh, uh, that we can't or shouldn't be involved uh, in targeted attacks in Pakistan or Yemen? Uh, whether we should as a matter of policy is, uh, is not, not my expertise. I think right. that the law uh, may permit that. I don't think that the paradigm of armed conflict is the only uh, body of law that may apply in that setting. I think the law of self-defense, part of customary international law, as well as the laws of the United States, constitutional powers of the President, the authorities that you, the Congress, have given to the President through the authorization for the use of military force, along with the intelligence laws that I made reference to in my remarks, I think all have a role to play in deciding what authority the United States has to operate in those non-traditional battlefield environments. In that kind of environment, would it make a difference uh, at all uh, to, to make it legal, if you will, uh, that the country give some kind of blanket or other kind of approval, as Yemen seems to have done, or Pakistan has certainly done. I think it's a host state consent is a very important ingredient, as Professor O'Connell suggested, but it's not uh, necessary. I think Mr. Coe made that observation even in his March 25 address right. in articulating the posture of the administration on these matters. Mr. Glazer, you have something yeah. to add? Um, I, I do uh, disagree with Professor O'Connell uh, on, on one issue, and that is sort of this narrow definition of a battlefield. It seems to me that a battlefield is a descriptive term and not a legal term, and that in an armed conflict, uh, those members of the enemy's forces who are legitimately targetable are essentially legitimately targetable anywhere. Now, traditionally, an armed conflict takes place in the country of the state parties and in international uh, airspace and, and waters. Um, and so there are issues basically from the law of neutrality that talk about when you can exercise an armed conflict in another country. And it's certainly discouraged, but if a neutral either were to give its consent or, um, more importantly, if a neutral was not exercising its obligations to prevent its territory from being used to the detriment of a, of a target party or a, a warring party, then, in fact, as the United States went into Cambodia out of necessity during the Vietnam War, uh, it is lawful for a country to conduct some limited operations under a high degree of necessity in countries which are not direct parties to the conflict. Let's bring it to present day real terms. Uh, the underwear bomber we, we know now was trained in Yemen. If we had actionable intelligence that he was being trained, uh, to do what he eventually did, and that he was in Yemen in one of these camps. Uh, the Yemenese authorities had given us blanket approval uh, to go after, but it wasn't part of a, an armed conflict that the Yemeni government was involved in. Uh, Ms. O'Connell, are you still saying that that would not be a justified uh, action? That's quite correct. Um, let me just say, in response to Professor Glazier, International law clearly has a definition of what an armed conflict is and what a battlefield is. I chair the International Law Association's Use of Force Committee. We have issued a report in 2008 that shows without doubt what international law supports as the definition of armed conflict, and it's not in a place where there's no intense organized armed fighting, and you do not have the right to use military tactics in those places. You have the right to use police enforcement uh, measures, and that's what the United Nations said when they reviewed our Yemen strike in 2002. They said that was an extrajudicial killing. They did not say what Professor Glazier said, that because these were al-Qaeda persons, they were related somehow to the armed conflict in Afghanistan, and they could be killed. That is not what the UN said. The experts on this particular law said it was extrajudicial killing, and nothing has changed in the, in the case that you bring up of, uh, of the more recent so-called underwear bomber. But let me just say, because there's some kind of a, a view, I think, that we've come to have in the United States, that this is somehow 
uh, restrictive law, unreasonable law, that we should be able to go out and kill these people wherever we find them, that this is how, somehow making our country less safe. Quite the contrary. I cite the just war doctrine because this is an ancient set of rules that really are consistent with our principles and our sense of what works, how we can really repress violence, how we can build the rule of law. And it is not by finding loopholes, interpreting broadly and loosely, and using more force than is really necessary in these situations. Law enforcement works against terrorism, and that's what we should be doing. But more importantly, when we don't follow the rule of law, and everyone knows that these, these drone attacks in places like Yemen or rural Pakistan, everyone in the world is watching us, and they know there's something wrong with this. We are not holding ourselves up to be the beacons of law, of the rule of law. We are not sending the signal that we want to see all countries suppressing violence and promoting the rule of law. This is a very dangerous policy because it's not consistent with the law. Thank you. Thank you.